Thank you very much for your introduction. It's a great honor for me to be uh, the 10th recipient of the um, Donna Kell Award and, uh, from Parkinson's Society Canada. Um, I don't do this work by myself. The work really, it's a teamwork. And so I, I, before I start my lecture, I'd like to um, uh, thank the, the member of our, our laboratory, which is the Center for Neurodegenerative Disease Research, for all of their contributions. And in particular, I want to thank my uh, partner in crime and uh, Dr. John Trojanowski, also my partner in life as well. And I think that we work very well together and, and me being the basic science person and, and John being the great translational person. And so without him and all of the work, it would not be possible. So I, I really want to thank him. I want to give him a, a hand of applause. <laughs> so I, I, uh, many of you actually have uh, heard my talk yesterday and liked it. And so I hope I can do the same today. I'm not sure. And, you know, since yesterday was yesterday and today is today. And, and so I hope I can, um, I can and do a good job and, and make you understand where, uh, what I'm, I, my, my science is all about. And so you're very familiar with, uh, with this first slide and um, Parkinson's disease. And it's the second most common neurodegenerative diseases, particularly affecting the elderly. And you're very familiar with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And in the last 20 years, I think a lot more effort has been focused on the non-motor symptoms and of Parkinson's disease. And particularly um, dementia, because um, dementia is common in advanced um, Alzheimer, uh, Parkinson's patients. So the two major pathology in patients with Parkinson's disease and are shown here in the, in the top panel, and there's loss of cells that make dopamine in the substantial Niagara Pass compactor. You can compare control, and which you can see this brown or, or black material here, the, the neuromelanin, and you can see it is dramatically reduced in, in Parkinson's patients. And the second uh, pathology in Parkinson's patients' brain, uh, these uh, accumulation of, of what, um, what is called Lewy body and, and Lewy neurite, and these were actually initially described and by Dr. Levy, or Lewy, as we call it in America. And so he did, it actually he spent the last part of his life in, in Philadelphia. So, uh, so we're honored to have him and, and, uh, in Philadelphia describing the pathology and, um, in Parkinson's disease. <coughs> and but, but, but Lewy bodies, it, but one of the, uh, the pathology they're found in neurodegenerative diseases. And this slide, what I'm showing you, are uh, the common neurodegenerative diseases that we know today. And Alzheimer's disease, is, uh, they're characterized by um, senile plaques. They're comprised of the, of the peptide called A-beta. And then um, Alzheimer's and, and another uh, dementing illness called frontotemporal degeneration are characterized by the accumulation of tau tangles. And then there are other neurodegenerative diseases as well. And for example, in um, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, and their accumulation of these pathology called TTP-43 aggregates. And um, so, um, but one of the common themes that is, that is happening and today is the realization that, um, that the, the pathology seem to progress. What I mean by progress is that there are more and more pathology accumulating in the brain of patients with these different neurodegenerative disease and over time when they have the disease. So for example, and you see that beta amyloid pack and they accumulate and as the patient and, uh, suffer and uh, uh, as the disease progress. And so uh, what we like to do is focus on um, Lewy bodies. And so Lewy body as initially described and, uh, by Dr. Brock, who actually described many of the progression of the pathology in all these different neurodegenerative diseases, particularly Alzheimer's and, and, and Parkinson's disease. And, and you see here, and so the way he described it and is that um, the pathology most likely start in the lower brainstem in the region called medulla or in the olfactory bulb. So in other words, that when you, you know, it regulates your smell sensation. So you, if you have 
um, neurons that are lost in the olfactory bulb, then you lose a sense of smell. But then the pathology progresses upwards, as you can see here, and to a, the, the brain region called substantia nigra, and also locus cerulis, and then to midbrain, and then to the basal forebrain. You can see the progression here, and then eventually to the cerebral cortex. So, and what he described also is that this, this, the, the pathology seemed to develop in a stereotypical manner. So in other words, that all Parkinson's disease, or most of them, and seem to have the same progression of the pathology. And many neurologists and, 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 um, uh, and clinicians have defined the fact that this progression of the Lewy pathology and correlate with movement disorder and often cognitive impairment. So in other words, that when the pathology is throughout the brain, and particularly in regions of the brain that regulate memory formation, then the patient develop cognitive impairment. And so all of this together with Lewy body and, and, and alpha-synuclein being the, the building block of Lewy body suggests that maybe alpha-synuclein itself is the transmiss transmissible agent. So then allow us to pose this hypothesis, and that is can misfolded alpha-synuclein in neurons recruit the endogenous alpha-synuclein, and to form these Lewy body inclusion and then propagate to other brain regions. And because when you see this progression and you know that it's alpha-synuclein, so it's a reasonable hypothesis. And this hypothesis that Brock uh, proposed has been around for a while, but there was not a lot of traction until about 2008 when two papers came out in Nature Medicine describing patients that, um, that had embryonic midbrain neuron graft. So if you remember in the 90s and maybe even in the 80s, and one of the common way to treat Parkinson's patient is to put, put um, embryonic midbrain neurons and into um, uh, Parkinson's patient to provide a source of dopamine, which is a substance that is lacking in patients with Parkinson's disease. And so what they did was that they put these graphs in and these patients live until they, they, they die and then they come to autopsy. And what both investigators found, which is really quite interesting, is that in the grafted neurons, they also develop Lewy body. Okay, so if they develop Lewy body, well, how could that happen? Is it because of a bad neighborhood, because the cells are dying? Or it's because of the fact that Lewy body from the host are now transmit or propagate to um, the grafted cell. So that it's really kind of a very, very intriguing observation. And so that allows to put forward two hypotheses and two working hypotheses. And the first is the transmission hypothesis. And I will talk a little bit more about the, the two hypotheses in the next couple of slides. But the second hypothesis, which is not maybe um, intuitive for you at this point in time, is called the strain hypothesis. And the reason why we put forward, put to put forward this, these two hypotheses is that the strain hypothesis will help us to, to, to examine the way the pathology spread. And the strain hypothesis maybe allow us to look at why some patients develop dementia and others don't. So let's focus on the first hypothesis, the transmission hypothesis. And so the qu question we pose is the same as I mentioned earlier. Can the spread of alpha-synuclein pathology be mediated by misfolded alpha-synuclein in model system? What I mean by misfolded is that the, the alpha-synuclein molecule has a different conformation than it normally found in the brain. Okay, so it's a, a misfolded or, 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 or abnormal conformation. So before I start, I really want to give you a little bit of background on alpha-synuclein. And what is alpha-synuclein, and, and, and why is it doing what it's doing in forming this Lewy body? And as it turned out that alpha-synuclein is a very soluble protein, it's also a very abundant protein in brain. And it localized in the part of the, 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 the uh, um, neuron that allow the neuron to talk to each other, which is called the synapse, so it's a presynaptic terminal. And after so many years, so, so alpha-synuclein was discovered as a building block and of Lewy body back in the late 90s. But even today, it's humbling to realize that we don't know what it does. And there are some hints, but there are really no concrete proof what it does. And the other thing that, that we and many laboratories do once they know that there is a disease protein, they want to mimic the pathology that you see in the patient in, in, a, in, in cells in a dish. 
an, or in an animal model. And so we try to do that. We try to overexpress alpha-synuclein in cells. And, um, but that don't lead to any pathology. So we couldn't understand why th they don't do that. But that's what happened, and most people have the same experience that we did. But then again, it doesn't work in cells, but it worked in the test tube, okay? If you take alpha-synuclein, purified alpha-synuclein, actually made in bacteria, and you just purify it, this what we call recombinant protein, and then you put it in a test tube, and then you manipulate under different conditions. And basically what we found was that it can actually form these fibrils that are signature of the building block of a Lewy body, okay, these, these fibrils that you see here. And we followed the reaction because these fibro actually bind to a chemical called thioflavin. And so they have a specific conformation that allows certain dye to bind to them. And now we can follow the reaction in the test tube. And you see that initially nothing seemed to be happen, f happening for a long time, for hours. And then all of a sudden it takes off. So you can see now this, the fibers are being formed because they are detected by the dye. And we don't understand why there's a lag phase, but we call that lag phase a nucleation phase. And we call the second phase elongation fa phase. But what is really interesting is that you can take a little bit of this material, 1% of this material, and you put that in a solution, a fresh solution of alpha-synuclein that are not aggregated into fibers like that. And you can actually, you can see in the red line here, it's sort of reduced the nucleation time. So in other words, it, it's it become much faster. So just this simple experiment allows us to, to, to show that the, the rate limiting step for this reaction is the amount of what we call nucleation species. So the, the material that can allow this reaction to occur. And because we add a small amount of this material, we can actually abolish this, what we call lag phase. This is the lag phase. So, so with that observation, we ask, well, it's the failure of cell to actually make alpha-synuclein pathology due to insufficient amount of seeds. So we reason, well, maybe we can help the cells. We can actually just throw some of the seeds into a neuron and see what happened. And so that was exactly what we did. So we took a little bit of the synthetic um, alpha-synuclein fibers and we make them, we, we, they're long pieces like that. We just break them up into smaller pieces, like you see here. And we literally just dump them into the medium where the cells are growing. And these are hippocampal neurons, but as it turned out that it could be neurons that make dopamine, for example, from the midbrain and other neurons as well. And basically what happened is that the cells actually pick up and the seeds that we put, and then it start recruiting the endogenous protein and then eventually the cell is completely filled with pathology and including Lewy body in the cell body. So what I want to do is to show you some of this data that I just described in this model and what happened. And so in, in the top here, you can see that um, there are a lot of pathology. There are pathology because they're staying with an antibody to a, a post-translational modified, so a modified form of alpha-synuclein, which is phosphorylated. Normally, you cannot see this phospho form of synuclein and in normal cells, but when they accumulate as pathology, and you can see now that they acquire the ability to, um, to be phosphorylated. And also, the other property of these cells is that um, they're in insoluble, they're pathology by definition, and they're insoluble. So the way we did it is that we extract the cells with a detergent. So to remove all the soluble proteins, so leaving behind only the pathology, okay? And so we did some controls. When you don't add fibros, you don't see um, any of these uh, green label and pathology. And also, we, if you take now neurons generated from a mouse without synuclein, and what we call synuclein knockout mouse, and again, you don't see the pathology. So these provide compelling data that the fibers are the one that ins get inside the cell and that would create the, the pathology. And, and the pathology also can be, um, and uh, can double label or, or co-stain with a, another marker called ubiquitin. So again, suggesting that this is abnormal. It's not the normal um, pathology. 
And so this is basically a little bit more detail. So yesterday, I, my talk was only half hour. Since I have a little bit more time, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail on these experiments. And so basically, the pathology, as we predicted in the schematic that I showed you, and accumulate over time in culture. So we add the fibers to the neurons. And then you look at them after about four days or so. And you see here that all you see is these little green dots that are localized at the terminal of the, of the synapse where um, the neurons talk to each other. And but now you, we wait for a little bit longer. By 14 days, you see here, the pathology is everywhere. It's not only in the nerve terminals, but in the cell body and also and in other neurites and uh, within the, the, the cell. And this is a set of experiments that we did basically purely to show that indeed these little fibers that we put into the culture are being taken up by the cell. And because you can see them inside a process here. So in the red is the, the seeds that we put in and the green is the pathology. So we know that they're inside the same process. And you can even look at the pathology using really, really, really high magnification, what we call electron microscopy. And this is a, actually even more fancy than that is immunoelectron microscopy. So what we do is that we mark the pathology and using a very, very high magnification microscope. And you see here that, that the, the black spots are labeling these fibers, much like what I showed you earlier in a test tube, the fibers in a test tube. So we can create the same fibers now in a cell as we did in a test tube. And so obviously when you have pathology in, um, in a neuron, and it, it must do something bad to the cells, and that's indeed exactly what we did here. So we measured the way in which cells communicate with each other. And so the cells talk to each other, they synchronize their activity. But now you see here, in the presence of these preformed fibrils, we call them all PFFs, you see now that they're a bit disordered, so they're not really synchronized, like um, in the absence of, a, of the fibrils. So suggesting that the communication with each other is, is disrupted. And also over time, if you incubate the cells with these fibers for 14 days, for example, now you're beginning to see the cells dying. And so this is a good, great system to really look at how um, the pathology play out within the cells compromising function and eventually causing cell to die. And so what I have told you really, you know, it's not, I didn't tell you anything about trans and, and spreading. So, and because in a dish, you know, we add the fibrils, I told you we add the fibrils and the fibrils get taken up, but you know, it, it doesn't demonstrate that the cells can spread from one cell to another. So this specific experiment allows us to look at that aspect in cell culture. So what we did was that we used this fancy device called the triple chamber microfluidic system. So what we did here is that you can see this little gold thing, they are cells, they are neurons. And um, so we put neurons in chamber number one and also neuron in chamber number two and also in chamber number three. So the only way the cells in chamber number one can talk to the cells in chamber number two is through sending a process, an axon, through these tiny little grooves that are between these chambers. That's the only way they can talk to each other. So we reason that if we put the fibrils in chamber number one, if we can see pathology in chamber number three, that's pretty compelling that they're spreading from one cell to another because the only way they can talk to each other is through these grooves. And so we did that experiment and these are the results. So in chamber number one, and we added the fibrils and we waited for about 18 days. And now you see the pathology, again, detected by the marker to phosphorosynuclein, and they're going down these grooves to chamber number two, okay? And then we look at chamber number three and following um, from chamber number two, you see pathology in chamber number three. And this is pretty compelling evidence that now that we demonstrate in cell culture, not in animal yet, but in, the, in, in cell culture, that indeed transmission occur. So this is a summary of the first part of my talk. I, I mentioned a lot of that in detail. So basically the, the um, alpha synuclein synthetic preformed fibers are internalized into neuron. They recruit the endogenous synuclein to form the pathology called Lewy body, Lewy neurite. 
and, and you can do that and in even from neurons from rats and, and as well as from mice and, um, and just without overexpressing uh, avasanuclein and just normal mice. And I didn't go through this, did some of these data with you, but basically the pathology is very similar to those you see in the human brain. And, um, and the aggregate de developed initially at the end of the terminal of the cells because the concentration of alpha synuclein is much higher. And then once it developed there and then it can be transported backward to the cell body and then or even forward, so both direction. And also these inclusions seem to impair function of the neuron and also the viability of the neuron. And so this is a, a first cell culture a neuronal model for sporadic Parkinson's disease. And I think that because it's so easy to use, I, I think that it really will facilitate um, PD research and drug discovery. Indeed, Dr. Fan is actually using the system and we had a conversation at, um, uh, at the reception and he's having some very interesting results. And I want more people to use the system because that's the only way that we can come up with cure um, for Parkinson's disease. So obviously, once we can do that in cell culture, we ask, well, can we do it in animal models? And you know, would the, in animal models, would the alpha synuclein containing Lewy bodies and, and neurites and be transmitted in brain? And, and also, what are the consequences of having this pathology? So initially, we uh, focused our attention on mice that overexpress alpha synuclein. And, and we, many years ago now, and develop what we call maybe the second generation of, of uh, mouse model for Parkinson's disease. The first generation, in my opinion, are the toxin models that with MPTP or 6-hydroxydopamine. And the second generation are the ones that we um, you know, try to overexpress alpha synuclein so that these mice would develop Lewy body pathology. And so indeed, we develop a, a line of mice that can do that. And so we decided to inject um, um, alpha synuclein into these mice. These mice actually get sick when they're old, like over a year of age, and they have a lot of pathology um, in the brain. And so, so basically, we took young mice, and so these mice are about two months of age. And they, at that age, they don't have any pathology. Even when they're six months, or as I said, up to a year old, they don't have much, much pathology. And so we injected um, and, um, the brains with actually uh, lysate, we initially used brain lysate from animals that develop the disease, okay? And so they have a lot of alpha synuclein pathology in the brain. And so we just took this crude lysate and we injected into the brain of this transgenic mouse model, which we call M83. And lo and behold, 90 days later, and you see a lot of pathology. And this study actually, and, and most of the, the study that I would describe on, on, on the mouse model, are headed by uh, Dr. Calvin Luke, who at that time was a, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. He actually spent 12 years in Montreal, and he did his undergraduate um, in, in, in McGill, and also his PhD in McGill, and he came to our lab in 2006. So this is one of the piece of work that he did. Um, you see that you know, the pathology are here, the brown cells, and it shows that they're accumulating phosphocyanuclein. And in fact, we showed that the pathology spread um, over time and, and in the animals. So initially, you see some pathology 30 days after injection and mostly in the, in the region, around the region where we injected the, the synthetic material, uh, in the, the lysate. And, and, but by 90 days or so, you see a lot of pathology everywhere. And so as I said, this is a, 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 a model, an artificial model. And um, they even develop some pathology in the spinal cord because there are high expression of avasanuclein in the spinal cord. But, um, but here you can see that if, they, if we inject lysate from mice that don't have any pathology, actually you don't see um, uh, 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 any, any pathology. So, so asympt asymptomatic lysis, so animals that do not have any phenotype and actually don't show any pathology. And we can do the same thing and taking um, uh, uh, lysate from human PD brain and injecting the same mice, you can see the same pathology. So all of this actually is supporting the idea, most likely alpha synuclein itself is, just, it's the, um, um, is the, the uh, um, transmissible species. And so we did directly that. So this is, again, Calvin's work. And so he basically took different 
uh, types of, of synthetic alpha-synuclein um, fibers and injected into the same mice. And again, he saw exactly the same thing. And in fact, what he showed here is really sort of interesting. So this is the mouse that we injected uh, synthetic alpha-synuclein fiber. And this is the mouse that developed Lewy body and, um, and by itself non-injected. So in other words, that as I mentioned earlier, these mice do get sick, but only at an old age. And even when they get sick, they don't have the kind of pathology that you see in um, these mice that after injection. So what is really amazing is that these mice um, have a shortened lifespan. Here, the mice, as I said, they develop uh, disease and they die with a medium lifespan of maybe about 400 days. But after we injected them with lysate, and um, they, they, have a, they have a shortened lifespan. And usually, they develop the motor symptom much like the non-injected mice and, um, and before they get sick. And, um, but what really is also extremely intriguing is that the interval between when we inject the mice and when they, uh, when they succumb to death seem to be highly consistent. And so, so this suggests, oh, uh, it doesn't really matter. And so, Okay, so suggesting that, you know, that the, the pathology is so widespread that it that eventually killed the mice. And um, so we also and try to understand why is this spreading throughout the, the, the brain? What is the mechanism? How does it do that? And so basically we saw, we observed a lot of pathology in, 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 in what we call the white matter tract. And they are the, 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 the uh, area which contain the axon that uh, connect one brain region to another, and you see a lot of pathology there. So we think that what happened is that the pathology get transported from the cell body to the nerve terminal and then to the next cell. So the summary of this part of my talk is that, and that the, the symptomatic brain lysate from the M83 transgenic mice and human PD brain, as well as the synthetic fibers, and um, initiate the conversion of alpha synuclein and the accumulation into Lewy body inclusion in these mice that overexpress mutant form of alpha synuclein. And that these inclusion, they bear morphology and biochemical similarities to those that are found in human neurodegenerative disease and in Parkinson's brain. And this rapid temporal and spatial transmission of, of, of uh, Lewy body-like pathology in, in, in these mice has happened, as you see, very rapidly. And we think that the white matter tract basically mediate this transfer. And we observe reduced lifespan um, in, in these mice. And so we saw this really very profound effect in these mice. And also, at that time, we had the data in the cell culture. So we thought, okay, and maybe we can go one step further to try to do this and develop this model in mice that do not overexpress alpha synuclein. So in other words, a model for sporadic Parkinson's disease. And so we, we really wanted to do that. So we want to know whether it's possible to do that, to see alpha synuclein pathology in these mice and, and wild type mice and without overexpression of alpha synuclein. And, and the other thing that was also unresolved as I started my talk by saying that there are two types of pathology in the brain of Parkinson patient. There are you know, loss of dopaminergic cells and also their accumulation of Lewy body. And yet scientists like myself have not been able to connect the dots. So we have not been able to show in a mouse model both of these pathology. And, and I mentioned earlier that the first generation of models are the MPTP and the 6-hydroxydopamine lesion model. So basically, you inject a toxin into the, the substantial Niagara and where the cells are, are pumping up dopamine. And you kill those cells, of course, you don't have any dopamine. So you would have the symptoms of movement disorder, and uh, like in those in, in Parkinson's disease. And people like me and many different laboratories have generated transgenic mouse model that I described to you just now. Um, but these models really don't show any dopaminergic cell loss. So basically, these, nobody can connect the dots between these two pathology. So we thought, OK, maybe we can demonstrate this in, um, in, in, in this non-transgenic model. And so we were very bold. And when Kelvin and I sort of thought about this idea. And so what we did was that we basically decided to inject um, 
And instead of human avacin nuclein now, we inject mouse avacin nuclein and synthetic mouse avacin nuclein to form fibers into a specific region of the brain called the dorsal striatum. And this is the part of the brain that connects di directly to uh, the dopaminergic cell in the substantial Niagara Pass compactor. So those neurons in this, in, 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 in this part of the brain and project, talks to the part of the brain in, and, and in the dorsal striatum. And so we inject the fibers into the, this, this area of the brain, and we waited 30 days. We asked a simple question, do we see pathology? And lo and behold, you see pathology accumulating. Not a lot, but you can see a little bit of the pathology in the injection site and in the striatum, and also in the cortex as well. When you wait now for a little bit longer, in 180 days, you see the pathology seem to spread. Um, because now you can see it in another brain region called the amygdala, and also in the opposite side of the brain. So remember that we only inject on one side of the brain, and now we're seeing pathology in the opposite side of the brain. So what this suggests was well, suggest that it, they talk to each other, and there's transfer from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. What about the substantial Niagara? Because I talked about the fact that they talk to each other, the dorsal striatum talk to the Niagara. And indeed, we see Lewy body pathology. So the green color that you see here are the marker for these neurons that express the enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase that allow dopamine to be made in these cells. And now at the higher power, in this high power microscope, you can see now the red are the phosphosynucleins, so the red are the pathology, the green are the cells that are making dopamine. So indeed now we're seeing pathology in the right type of cells in, um, uh, that make dopamine. And we map the spread um, and of the pathology. And again, much like in the transgenic mice, the pathology gets more and more widespread over time. And you see that this is the brown, uh, the, the, the gray dot here is the site where we injected. But you can now see over an, an 180 days, the pathology is everywhere in the cortex, in the amygdala, in many, many different parts of the brain. And also, and, and this is basically um, highlight um, the spread of the pathology, which follow the way in which the dorsal striatum and connect to many different parts of the brain. And in fact, we have one really intriguing observation, and that is that we saw a little bit of pathology in the olfactory bulb. Remember, I, I started my talk by saying that there's one region that we think and in Parkinson's patient may be the site where um, the pathology developed and then spread and to other part of the brain. And we saw some pathology and it, here. And we know that there's really no direct connection between the olfactory bulb and the dorsal striatum. So the fact that we see some pathology suggests that perhaps then that the pathology go in addition to talking to the, to the cells that you, you usually talk to, and maybe the pathology actually be released and picked up by another cell that is not necessarily directly connected to the striatum. So there's a hypothesis. We, uh, we don't have any ev solid evidence to support that at this point in time, but it's very intriguing. So, so what I'm just set to you, describe to you is that the alpha cell nuclein pathology spreads through the interconnecting area of the brain. So in other words, that what we call neuroanatomical connectome. So now we saw the pathology in substantial Niagara. Would that lead to dopaminergic cell loss? I mean, that's a million dollar question, right, that we want to answer. And so on the top panel here, you see the pathology in the Niagara and as the animal after post-injection. So 30 days, 90 days, and um, 180 days. And um, although that the Niagara talked to many different parts of the brain, it's very interesting that the uh, substantial, the, uh, uh, the striatum talked to many different parts of the brain, but the, the substantial Niagara and on one side do not talk to the opposite side. So it's really, really convenient for us because we can use the opposite side as a control. And so you see here that, that the, the, the tyrosine hydroxylase staining cells in the substantial Niagara. And um, so at one month after we injected the fiber, we saw some pathology, but we saw really minimum cell loss. But now by three months or 90 days, and now you see that, that the brown cells are diminished in number. And also by 180 days, you see now there are really a lot of 
cell loss, and it's quantified here. So about 50% of the cells are gone, and 180 days after we injected the fibrils into um, an, the striatum. And so obviously, when you have cell loss, dopaminergic cell loss, what are the consequences? And so the consequence is the fact that they have motoric phenotype. And so there are two assays that we use to monitor and this phenotype. And so you see that this uh, Y hang and, and, and determine strength, grip strength of the mice. And you see that the grip strength is, is dramatically um, uh, reduced as the animal develops the disease. And rotor rod you know, measure another type of movement. And you see also that it's reduced. And but these animals are cognitively normal. So in this part of my talk, what I have just shown you is that um, alpha-synuclein can be transmitted or spread in, uh, in wild-type mice. And that these mouse alpha-synuclein perform fibrils and initiate this conversion and, um, into Lewy body, Lewy neuride. And um, these pathology progressively expand within um, and the brain following their connections. And that the pathology drive the selective loss of substantial Niagara dopamine neurons, in other words, of these neurons that make dopamine, and resulting in the behavior impairment, and that we see the reminiscence of, of um, and human Parkinson's disease. So what I'd like to do now is to, and, and for the final um, 10 or 20 minutes or so, I want to talk about um, the strain hypothesis. And, um, and so basically, what we want to understand is that are there different, uh, is there any confirmation Shift. So in other words, shape shift that allow different clinical manifestation of Parkinson's disease. So are there any evidence even to support this idea? And, um, and, and many of the neurologists sitting in the room actually know a lot more about this than I do, that, um, that about 40% of patients with Parkinson's disease suffer dementia, and that Parkinsonism are very common in Alzheimer's patients, particularly in late stage of the disease. And that from a, um, a pathological point of view, that, um, that Lewy bodies and, um, are also found in 50% of Alzheimer's disease. And that in Parkinson patients, um, many patients, about maybe 30 to 40% of these patients, actually develop Alzheimer's pathology with plaques and tangles. And so that this suggests that there may be a relationship between Lewy body, which are common, for motor deficit and also these neurofibrillary tangles, which are found mostly in patients with a cognitive um, deficit. And, and we want to pose this question, are there any relationship between these two? And in fact, we did some work even 10 years ago. And this was a paper that we published in 2003 um, in Science, actually by another Canadian, and by Moa Jasson, actually, he also graduated, did his PhD in McGill. So you guys produce a lot of great students. And, and so in any case, so what he showed in a test tube is that alpha-synuclein and tau actually facilitate each other's uh, aggregation into fibrils. And in, in also at the same time, about the same time, and, and uh, John Duda, and, and a neurologist, actually showed that you can observe both an alpha-synuclein pathology in the red and um, no, in the green, I'm sorry, and also a tau pathology in, in the red in the same cell. So suggesting that n there may be some sort of relationship or interaction between the two. So, um, so we ask this question, can alpha-synuclein and cross seed tau in our transmission model? So in other words, that does this represent another shape of alpha-synuclein that would actually recruit tau pathology? So this was actually a brilliant idea of a, a graduate student of mine, and her name is Jing Guo. And so she, she started by uh, taking some of the synthetic fibers that we've made, and then she, um, instead of just throwing into cells and looking at alpha-synuclein pathology, she also wanted to look at tau pathology. But she was very disappointed because she really didn't see anything. And, and so she said, okay, maybe I can manipulate the system, and maybe I can generate new shapes of alpha-synuclein and misfolded um, protein. And then that would be able to, to, to recruit tau. So she developed this way in which she can generate 
and different preparation of alpha synuclein. So what she did was that, um, so this is the, the way we did the, the alpha synuclein aggregation, as I told you earlier, is that we manipulate alpha synuclein in solution. And so we did that. And so then she took a little bit of the fibrils, much like what I showed you earlier and in vitro, and she then put in the fresh solution of what we call monomer, which is basically soluble alpha synuclein. And she kept doing this for 10 times. Okay, and then she took each one of these preparations and she put them into neuron and then she wanted to see tau pathology. Indeed, that's what she saw and at a passage about six and seven. Now she's beginning to see tau pathology together with alpha synuclein pathology and they seem to be in the same space and, and there's actually less uh, synuclein pathology than than, um, than this particular uh, preparation, what we call P1. So she actually gave them specific names. So this preparation that generated de novo by just making of a synuclein fibrils, she called it strain A. And she also called these later passages strain B, the ones that can recruit tau. She then you know, asked, well, we can do it in cells. Can we do it in animals? So to do this, we injected the two separate preparations, the strain A and the strain B, into mice that overexpress tau. And these mice, again, like the synuclein mice that I talked about earlier, and um, the transgenic mice, and they develop tangles, but at a much later stage and um, as they age, so over a year old. And here, we injected synuclein now into tau mice, and we waited and for three months and also for, for, for six months. The question we ask is that would strain B, which in cell culture can recruit tau pathology, be able to recruit tau pathology in an animal model much more effectively than strain B, than strain A? And indeed, that's what she found. You can see here at three months, there's a lot of pathology elicited by injection of strain B into this tau transgenic mice. And whereas the strain A, at three months, there's almost no pathology. Even at nine months, it's nothing compared that to strain B. So we can demonstrate the strain specificity, both in cell culture and also in animal model. And obviously, we want to understand why this is happening, because basically, these two preparations, they have the same protein, which is alpha synuclein. They just differ from each other from the shape, so in other words, they have different shape. And so we ask ourselves, well, can we look into um, human um, diseases and that have alpha synuclein pathology and have support for our concept that they are different shape? Well, so basically, if you look at Lewy body in, in the Niagara, and which is the region where, which is most affected in Parkinson's disease patient, and you see that these Lewy body are kind of have a very, very distinct um, uh, morphology. So they have a, a core and a halo, okay? But now when you look at the alpha synuclein, the Lewy bodies, in the cortex, they actually look different. They have a solid mass in the cytoplasm, so in, 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 uh, in the cytoplasm of the cell. And moreover, there's a different disease that you might be familiar with called multi multiple system atrophy. And uh, in this disease, they actually accumulate of a synuclein in a totally different cell type altogether in a cell type called oligodendrocytes. And so they're neuron, they're glial cells, and oligodendrocytes is one of the major and, and glial cell type. And so because of the fact that they're different, they're in diff their oligodendrocytes are different from neurons, so it, it's, it's reasonable, the hypothesis, that they may be due to different strain of alpha synuclein or different conformation of, of alpha synuclein that allow this to happen. And so we want to test this, and this give us you know, a lot of evidence to support the idea that maybe they have the alpha synuclein pathology generated from different strains or different shapes. So, so what we did was that we used three different ways to try to determine the differences between strain A and strain B. And we used a number of biophysical analysis, and we also used a number of biochemical analysis. And then we also try to generate strain-specific antibodies so that allow us to say that, okay, this is strain A and this is strain B. So we did that. So the first set of studies that Jing did was biophysical studies. 
And, um, but basically, using this high, you know, uh, using electron microscopy that allows us to really look at, look at the fibers in, in, in high magnification, we don't see any differences between them. And again, you know, I mentioned that they bind to the dye and uh, chemical dye called thioflavin. There's no difference between the two preparation either. And using two other different physical chemical methods and, and circular diochromism and also FTIR, we don't see differences either. So basically, biophysical, biophysical methods could not distinguish these two strains. But then we try to see whether or not the, the, the folding of these, of the, 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 the two strains are different. To do that, we subjected um, the alpha synuclein and preparations and, uh, and to a digestion with an enzyme called proteinase K. So this enzyme had been used previously to look at this, the how a molecule can fold and, and within each other. And so, um, so we took the different preparation of alpha synuclein, we treat them with the same concentration of proteinase K. And lo and behold, we found that strain B which is down here, seem to generate more what we call fragments. And so when the enzyme digests the protein, it generates different fragments. And whereas this strain A, as shown here, it seemed to have much fewer fragments. So suggesting that this may be uh, the differences between strain A and strain B. And then Jing actually went on to do a little bit more experiment just to confirm that what we saw was correct. And indeed, she showed the same, the same thing. If you use different concentration of the enzyme, you always generate the same pattern of differences between strain B and strain A. And then we actually sequence every single one of these fa fragments and from the one end of the molecule, which we call the end terminus of the molecule. So we know exactly how these fragments are generated. And so basically, and this is a summary of some of the fragments. So, so the second fragment, which is this one here, and um, has fewer residue in the um, end terminus. So it has about 20 residue less. And, um, and then the third fragment seemed to also have a little bit truncated further and in the end, ter end terminus. And also, there are two other bands that, that also have the same end terminus. So that suggests that maybe the molecule not only truncated one end, but also at the other end as well. And so we use a number of antibodies that we've generated in the laboratory that recognize different part of the alpha synuclein molecule from one end to the other. And by doing that, we actually show that indeed that the, um, the end terminus uh, the C terminus is also um, uh, um, uh, digested by proteinase K. So, so basically, all of this effort show that strain A is much more compact. Because it's much more compact, it's not as accessible to an, an protease digestion. Whereas strain B is much more open. So the enzyme have more accessible, it can be more accessible to the protein. And so this is kind of the schematic that we've, we've generated and to explain the differences between these two conformations. And finally, we generated an antibody to strain B. And so this is a very simple experiment. We look at the affinity of the antibody to bind to um, strain B and strain A. You can see now there's a huge differences between the ability of the antibody to detect strain B and strain A. And so these further confirm that strain A and strain B can be distinguished by strain-specific monoclonal antibodies. And so actually this is really useful tool for future experiments as well. So in summary of the alpha synuclein strains, and so we've generated at least two strains of alpha, alpha synuclein um, um, preformed fibers, which is really in a test tube. And we think that there are probably going to be a lot of different strains. For example, the, st the, the strain that I talked about, the, the inclusion in uh, multiple system atrophy, that may represent yet another strain. And um, so, so these strains, one can recruit tau, the other cannot. And, um, and we think that they differ from each other because of the conformation, because we can show that with an enzyme that did digest, that degrade the protein, and also with the specific antibody. And we think that the extreme end of the protein probably um, confers strain specificity and evolution and diversity. 
So this is a working model now to explain the pathogenesis of, of um, neurodegenerative diseases, particularly um, Parkinson's disease. So the, the, the protein of synuclein somehow becomes folded within a cell, and then it could recruit the endogenous protein to form Lewy bodies and new Lewy neurite. And some of these misfolded protein can also be released from the cell and be, can be picked up by another cell, neighboring cell, and continue the process. And then another misfolded alpha-synuclein with a different shape and can also elicit and initiate from a different cell. And this particular shape not only can mediate the recruitment of alpha-synuclein, but it can also mediate the recruitment of tau and turn that into pathology as well. And again, some of these bad shape can be released from this particular cell <laughs> and then can be picked up by a neighboring cell and the process starts all over again. And so, so basically, we have these two hypotheses that we're trying to test and, 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 and understand more about the pathogenesis. So the transmission hypothesis and allow us to look at the onset and the progression of the disease. And the strain hypothesis allow us to look at the divergence and the convergence of the disease. And so, and um, this is my acknowledgement slide. And I mentioned them along the way. And Jing Guo is the, was the graduate student who did the work on the strains. And Calvin did all the work on the animal model of uh, synuclinopathy. And Laura Bobocelli Dali, uh, she actually had the uh, cell culture study and, um, for uh, alpha synuclein pathology. And the rest, the rest of the lab and their contribution are extremely important. And this is, these experiments are complicated, so require really all the members and many of the members of, of our Center for Nutrient Disease to participate. And as I mentioned, that the work and the, all the work are done in collaboration with John Trojanowski, and this is our funding source. And I thank you for your attention. I'll answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. It was a wonderful lecture. And um, I would ask uh, those who have questions to please raise your hand. There will be someone, I believe, who will bring you a microphone to ask, and maybe I can get it started uh, while people are thinking of questions. So one, one obvious question seems to be that uh, we're finding Lewy bodies in the gut and we're seeing olfactory dysfunction early. Have you tried providing or injecting synuclein either in the gut or in the nose of any of these animals and seeing any kind of pathology? Um, I actually have a microphone. Um, so we, we haven't really um, done those experiments. I know that there are many laboratories are trying to do that. And actually, we did some pilot experiments and trying to see whether we can um, get alpha-synuclein in through the nose. But what happened was that we killed the neurons because we, I think we put too much in. So um, <laughs> and anyway, so I think that it still needs to be done. And, and I'm sure that many people are doing this. And that really is the, the, the whole idea is to have many people participate and so that the, the field can move forward. And the other thing I want to mention is that, um, and there may be a poster here in, in the uh, WPC, and a, a group in Michigan State University, they have been able to reproduce everything that we've done in the rat. And so, and the rat may be even a more powerful system because there are a lot of behavioral tests that um, they are much more sensitive uh, in the rat than in the mice. And so, you know, so I think that, that this may actually be, um, uh, the model can be developed from, from mice and all the way maybe even to primates. Ben, you had a question? Uh, great talk. So I have quick, a quick question. Uh, yes. Have you found a way like to uh, shorten the transmission time instead of waiting 200 days? You can do it in two weeks and can find a cure maybe in two years. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the, the spread of the pathology is really, that it correlates with um, the amount you, you inject and also, and, and if you inject in multiple regions, then you can create pathology much faster and, and, and also uh, much more widespread. Um, but I, I think that, you know, to some extent, I, I, I think that um, maybe 200 days is too long. Um, but I think that, you know, and a year, six months to a year would really mimic 
more the human disease because at the end of the day, uh, we want to treat the human disease. And um, so I think that the mouth, mouse model or any model that faithfully recapitulates um, what is in human, to me at least, is more valuable. Dr. Fung. Yep. Well, first of all, it's fantastic work. And it leads to new ideas about Parkinson's disease, of course. But the other thing, <coughs> I think one of the other impacts of this is that you develop a new animal model, yeah. an animal model that more closely resembles the human person with Parkinson's disease. Yeah. And that, that animal model, therefore, could be the pr a perfect one for studying ways to slow down the progression of the disease. Right. The toxin model, you know, everything we've tried on those toxin models that worked didn't work on humans. So maybe right. your animal model now right. uh, will be developed and will be right. used, and we, if we can slow down the progression of this animal model, maybe that'll be translated into the human. I think it right. has great impact, and uh, it can be used for st testing new drugs on this animal model before we go into the human. So I think we're going to speed up more things, and I think the people in this room and the whole Congress should be very pleased for this work because I think that's going to hasten the day we're going to cure Parkinson. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in, in that front, I just want to add one comment, okay? And uh, we actually work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation and to facilitate them being able to distribute and uh, the technology to anybody who would be interested. And so we also do that as well. We share our reagents to, um, to our with our colleagues. But, um, but now I think Michael J. Fox is involved as well. So I think that the goal is really to try to come up with, with therapy for, for Parkinson patients. One in the back. My, <coughs> my question is, is uh, the two strains that you had, is one more than the other prone towards Parkinson's? And if so, it's taking you this long to get to where you're at, and I'm really glad to where you're at, how long before you can perceive it would reach us at the street level? Right, so, so I think both strain can cause Parkinson's disease, but I think that strain B is, is our effort to try to explain why some patients and develop a cognitive impairment and others don't. And because those with cognitive impairment have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain as well, so we try to understand that. And so this is a little bit more detailed and, 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 and granular. And in terms of coming up with a cure, I think Dr. Fon said it the best way. And I think that if more people use the system to test for, to identify drugs, and I think Dr. Fon is doing that now. And so many pe more people would do it, then the more we would come up with therapy. And that's the idea. Sir. Thank you. Uh, just to explain to the audience and to circle back to Donald Kahn, uh, what kind of paradigm shift that you have, have really given us in, in uh, such a great lecture. Uh, when I trained with Donald 25 years ago, uh, his view at the time, and, and, and I'm not trying to be critical, but where we were was that Donald very much thought that Louis bodies were a tombstone and an incidental finding okay. in this condition. It was something else that was the uh, going on that was really the important part, but the, the Louis body was just sort of an afterthought. Right. Um, really, the paradigm shift that you're re uh, suggesting is that the uh, fibrils in the Lewy body, uh, the alphas nuclein fibrils, are a primary cause uh, of the de neurodegeneration. Um, so my question comes up is, uh, is this an exogenous cause? Does it come from outside the body? We've heard about gut uh, and nasal uh, areas that are right. involved. Or is it some kind of endogenous kind of thing? We know from the um, genetic studies that there are genetic causes yeah, yeah. Uh, that lead to alpha synuclein mutation or uh, duplication or triplication yeah. of the, the genes. So uh, do you think it's causative and does it come from inside or out? I think that, you know, obviously I don't have a good answer. And, um, but I think I can speculate, okay. And I think that these um, misfolded proteins and like alpha synuclein or even tau. And um, the, the, the cells and make mistakes. They, they, they don't, they're not always correct. So they may turn out bad form of the proteins. But when you're young and healthy, your cells can dispose of them. And, but as you age, and they may start to accumulate a little bit. And in fact, you know, it's known that, that when people age, they have um, plaques and tangles in the brain. 
And so I'm not, you know, this is, there's some evidence for it. And, but I think that, you know, for, for Abbott's and Lucan, for Parkinson's disease, there are many, many risk factors. And, you know, for example, environmental risk factors and has been quite well documented by epidemiological studies. And so, I, and it's a big black box right now, but I, I think that it's reasonable to hypothesize that you know, your cells are less efficient in getting rid of these bad proteins and that other factors contribute to um, the disease. And so, you know, and the disease progressed very slowly. And because I didn't say this um, in earlier on in my talk, but there are differences between mouse avacinuclein and human avacinuclein. Thank God for human avacinuclein, which is not the same as, as mouse. And mouse actually can aggregate much more readily um, and in, in, in a test tube. Um, so in fact, mouse avacinucleans have one of the most malignant mutations that have been found for familial and, and Parkinson's disease called the Contursi family. It's one residue that's changed and from the human and, and, and between human and mouse. So the human form fibrillates much more slowly, whereas the mouse form is very rapid. And so to some extent, you know, th our ability to develop this mouse model is because the mouse is on our side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Lee, you, you've shown that alpha synuclein pathology can kill dopamine neurons. Right. Uh, do you think it can also kill cell replacement therapy research? Boy, uh, that's a difficult question, and uh, I don't know. Should we give up cell therapy research? Um, I don't know. I think that, um, you know, it, it depends which way you look at it. Um, because the progression really is pretty slow um, for um, Parkinson's disease, or at least the majority of the patients. Um, so um, I don't know, but it's a different model. And I think that both, you know, would be useful in terms of treating patients. Um, but if I put my money, if I have to put my money, I put it on um, our model. Intrigued by your, um, by the you met you you never mentioned the word prion in your whole talk, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's thinking about it, right? <laughs> so I mean, obviously you, you I'm sure you didn't you did that for a reason, and you also said something very interesting, which is we use mouse to inject in the mouse, and we know in prions there's a species barrier, right, right. and so do you think that there's a species barrier? Did you try human and it just didn't work? I mean, sometimes you know these things. Right get, you know, try and error and so on. So yeah. what, what are your thoughts about that? So, so actually there, there, there was a paper published and, uh, earlier this year and where the investigators from Japan injected human um, alpha-synuclein into wild-type mice, much like what we did. Um, but, um, and, and, and actually the reason why we beat them to the punch is because we use mouse. And they actually saw pathology, but it took much, much longer. Um, so there's a slight species barrier, but not a complete one. So that you still can develop Lewy body, injecting human avacinuclein fibroids into mice, and, but it's not as efficient. Well, I want to thank you for such an outstanding uh, lecture and also for the uh, immense contribution. And hopefully will be, uh, many of us will be continuing to use this model in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.